Welcome to episode four of the Land Partners podcast. I'm your host, Connor, and with me is Dave. Hello. And Matt. Yo, yo. We have an action-packed episode for you today. We're coming at you with three reviews, maybe even four, depending on how Dave does his review. But uh, we're Dave's going to be reviewing Halo Wars 1 and 2 for us today. I'm going to be giving a review of Dragon Age Inquisition. Matt's going to be talking about Lego Jurassic World. Our discussion topic will be achievements. What is the point anymore? Uh, talk a couple news stories going on. And finish out the episode with our top three Mario Kart games. What, who we are is we're just three people who you know work full-time jobs, have families, but we also love to game. And we have other hobbies on top of that, but we always try to find the time in a day, like whether it be an hour or two hours, to just sit down and play a game. Whether it be a brand new game at GameStop or an old game that was very popular two or three years ago, we'll play anything, just whatever catches our eye at the time. So what we hope that you get out of this podcast is maybe just you relate to us just a little bit. Maybe you're thinking about buying a brand new game right now, but you're just not sure. Hopefully, we will help inspire you to either buy that game or not buy that game and go with a slightly older game at a cheaper price, but still have a ton of fun playing it. So if that's something that you're into and you could relate to us, uh, please find us on Facebook. Uh, Send us a message if you have questions or any games you want to hear reviews on. You could, we're on iTunes. You could hit that subscribe button. That way you get our weekly episodes uploaded to you right away. We're going to be recording every Wednesday, bringing you new episodes every week. You could message us on Twitter. Uh, most importantly, just if you have a question or anything, please find us on Facebook and send us those messages. If you have list ideas, anything at all, we'd love to hear from the listeners. So uh, Matt or uh, Dave's going to go ahead and get us started off with Halo Wars. Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, so, my job here is to talk about Halo Wars, and if you're unfamiliar with Halo Wars, it initially came out on the Xbox 360. My review is going to focus mostly on what you would be buying nowadays, which is the Definitive Edition. And so, um, Halo Wars is in the Halo universe, just as the name says, um, you, where you've got the UNSC and the Covenant and the Flood and all that. It's a real-time strategy game, which is very different from what we're used to with the Halo numeral series, and it plays more like a StarCraft than a Halo 3 or Halo 4 or Halo 5. Uh, what you do in the game is you take control of either the UNSC or Covenant, and you do battle with uh, somebody else. You're building up armies. Um, You're collecting resources and you have these epic battles on these big battlefields from a top down view. And uh, so if you're not familiar with real time strategy, that's what that is. Um, If you're the Covenant, you get special leaders that lead your army with special abilities and they get like weaker units that aren't really super powered, but it's because you have a general on the field. And uh, for example, the prophet of regret, a character from halo is in the game and he has these little cloaking melee units that aren't so great, but they have a tactical use to them. And his bread and butter move is like an independence day beam that shoots down from the sky and, you know, rains down terror on the opposing team. And if you're the UNSC, the humans, Uh, You get superpowered units, but you don't get necessarily a hero on the battlefield. Uh, For example, uh, Lieutenant Forge has grizzly tanks, which are basically superpowered scorpion tanks, and you just upgrade them. So you can do skirmish, and you can do a campaign. The campaign is okay. My friends and I spend most of our time in skirmish, which is where the meat of the game will be played uh, if you have Xbox Live and you can play online. Um, What I liked about the game is the unit selection is actually pretty decent for being a console real-time strategy game. They use a rock, paper, scissors type of countering system that works really well, in my opinion here. Uh, Leaders are pretty well balanced, and none of them seem too ridiculously overpowered. Uh, The game lends itself to being played with a controller rather than mouse and keyboard, and what's interesting about that is if you do have it on PC, because it is uh, cross-platform for the Definitive Edition, it, I actually tried playing it with a mouse and keyboard and ended up hooking an Xbox controller into my PC to play it because it just feels better for some reason 
on a controller. And I don't know if that's just bias uh, for me, but I don't believe it was made for mouse and keyboard. Uh, it's easy to learn, but hard to master, which I also like. Games like that tend to have a long lifespan. Uh, maps are very well designed, and there's no unfair pay-to-win DLC. What I didn't like about it was that, obviously, for PC, mouse and keyboard felt like an afterthought, and the only other game I've really encountered that with is Bioshock, uh, the original game. Uh, it's it's very simplistic compared to StarCraft and Command and & Conquer, and I actually read a couple of reviews that referred to Halo Wars as the Fisher-Price real-time strategy game. Um, <laughs> So, I, I mean, I disagree with that to an extent, but also kind of agree with that. It's very simplified compared to, like, a StarCraft. And micromanaging battles, uh, Uber Micro is pretty impossible in this game with a, a controller. You can micromanage to some extent, but the control scheme is made to accommodate a controller. So, obviously, you're not going to have pinpoint accuracy even if you're using a mouse and you'll have to play the game to really understand what I mean there. My final rating uh, of definitive edition is an eight out of 10. I think it's a great game. The cons I can overlook, just use a a controller instead of a mouse and keyboard and don't expect it to be as deep as Starcraft. And you're going to have a lot of fun with this. I'd recommend it to halo fans looking for a different experience in the halo universe. And also I'd recommend it to RTS fans who play console The reason I didn't review Halo Wars 2, even though I've had that game for a while now, is I kind of stopped playing it. And the main issue that I found with Halo Wars 2 right now that makes it unplayable to me is the fact that it is a pay-to-win game where they're releasing leaders as DLC. And Halo Wars 1 never did that. Halo Wars 1 only released maps and different game modes. Uh, Halo Wars 2, I don't like the direction they're going. You, you you buy specific leaders that no one else has access to unless they pay extra money on top of the $60 that you already had me pay for your console RTS game. So it left a real sour taste in my mouth. And so I'm not planning to go back to Halo Wars 2 until uh, they make those leaders either free to download or that game might be getting traded in. So, Well, it's funny that you mentioned the mouse and keyboard thing and you saying that the uh, controller was an advantage. Cause coming from you, that's, that's definitely the truth because you will find the mouse and keyboard to be better than For sure. anything. <laughs> so if you think that's the better option, the mouse or the control is a better option, then I'm, I'm going with your word on that one. But uh, moving on to Dragon Age. Uh, Dragon Age is available on pretty much all the platforms, PS4, Xbox One. It was developed by BioWare, released back in November 2014. I didn't play this game until very late in 2016 because you know, I, I didn't really know about the game. I wasn't sure if it was worth the 50 or $60. Never really played a game like that. I didn't play Dragon Age 1 or 2. But it took me 45 hours to complete. Which, in our time, you know, we only play an hour or two a day. You know, we're very limited. But uh, in that 45 hours, that's a big commitment. So I really wanted to make sure this game is going to be worth my time. That's going to be a month and a half of my gaming time dedicated to Dragon Age. A little bit about the game. It's just you're basically at the beginning of the game. There's this huge catastrophe and your character is the one that it survives it. And from this catastrophe you're given this special power to close these rifts and what the rifts are is just these portals or gates that allow demons to come invade and so the whole basis of the game is you're trying to go around close all these rifts and basically defeat the men who cause these rifts the gameplay is just third person dungeon crawling kind of at your own pace you kind of go one way which is huge world to explore you can Go in one dungeon. If you don't want to do that, you can go a different way. So there's a lot to do, a lot to explore, a lot of side missions. A couple things I liked about the game was the RPG system. Like I said, it's an RPG. It's very, very in-depth. There is a lot you can do. You can upgrade all these different abilities. You can give yourselves all these different attacks. So it's very in-depth, and I loved it because I felt like I was always earning something and gaining experience for a purpose not just oh now i'm a level 10 cool what does that mean you know it it meant something because now my character was that much stronger the combat i liked a lot because you had you had several different attacks that you come with you could do like a magic attack or just a normal attack so the combat was fun there was a lot of enemies so it's not like you're just battling one guy there's a whole swarm of enemies coming at you at all times one thing that i thought 
I've never really seen in a game like this was the amount of different maps and worlds. You can be in a world that's all desert, so all the enemies are completely different in that world. You can then go to a forest world where all the enemies are different there. So there's a huge differentiation amongst the maps that kept it very interesting for me. I never got bored playing over 45 hours. You know, all you want to see is just keep changing it up, and this game did. There is a large plethora of side quests, whether it's going around, closing all the rifts, or finding random people and they give you things to do. Like Sometimes, yes, it's a fetch quest, and uh, once I talk about Wind Waker another time, I'll tell you my opinion on fetch quests. Ew. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, Dragon Age doesn't overkill the fetch quest. I mean, they're pretty, pretty optional. They're not forcing you to do this fetch quest, so that's okay. A couple things I didn't like about the game was the story was a little confusing at times. It was it was kind of hard to follow. There's a lot of different characters, a lot of dialogue, so you could imagine in a 45-hour game, if you're not looking to follow a story, you know, the game was still fun, but uh, it got a little got a little much at times just because there were so many different characters and a lot going on and so that, that was a little too much for me maybe a little bit clear one my major complaint that i had from this game was that in a game like title dragon age you don't really fight a whole lot of dragons i think maybe in the 45 <laughs> hours i played i fought i couldn't recall one dragon fight but I want to say that there was two dragon fights. I mean, how do you name a game Dragon Age and only give yeah. me one dragon fight? You know, that doesn't seem right to me. Um, so well, it wasn't called Dragon's Age. It was called Dragon <laughs> that's true, Age. That's true. You know, we had one dragon, man. Come Joke, on. Joke's on me. The so, first Dragon Age had a lot of dragons, and then I think they just kept the title <laughs> for the franchise. <laughs> but here's the thing about that is they call it Dragon Age, and that's okay. But the main story, I only fought about two but I, I read up on it afterwards because I was disappointed that I didn't fight more dragons. And it turns out that if you do more side quests and all those extra things, that then you will fight more dragons. And I'm like, i got to pump another 40 hours into this game just to fight more dragons. I'm not into it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang up the towel on this one. And so, you know, I was a little disappointed with that. It, the huge boss fight, though, at the end where you do fight, you know, the big dragon, that's very satisfying. It's a long battle, but uh, it was very satisfying. Getting from place Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Getting from <laughs> place to place could get a little old. Uh, you do have a horse, but you know, you might as well just walk because getting on the horse is annoying, getting off the horse is annoying, turning corners is annoying, stuff like that. You know, I don't there's not really a whole lot of games that master the whole horse thing. So uh, I just don't like that having to get from place to place. Another thing I didn't like, it's a very minor detail. But it kind of goes along with Witcher. I have played Witcher 3 for, I got to like first 10 hours, I didn't play it in depth. But in Witcher 3, you are overburdened if you have too many items. Dragon Age has that also. Though the difference between Witcher 3 and Dragon Age is Dragon Age you could have a lot more items to carry before you get overburdened and have to start dropping stuff, which is good. I just think overall, having a maximum capacity of things you can carry on your person is just, I just don't like it. It's annoying. I then have to be mindful of, should I pick up this item? Is this item worth it or not? I just get so tired of that. I, that's why I like games like Dark Souls and Bloodborne, where they don't even, you could have thousands of the same thing for all they care. Like, I, that's what I don't want to have to worry about how many items I have. Minor, minor complaint, but it did get annoying having to uh, worry about, hey, I'm about to enter a dungeon. What's my inventory at right now? Can I pick up everything as I'm going through this dungeon or not? I mean, if that's not something that bothers you, don't worry about it. It's just a little thing by me. My overall. I would say this is a 8.5. It was really great. You know, in our 8s, we judge our 8s by great, and I would say this is a great game. It was a couple steps away from being amazing. Like like I said, if I was to fight more dragons, maybe it would have been an amazing game, and I would have had it in the 9s. So that was one little I thought that was a big miss, not fighting more dragons. I think it's a great game right now if you're somebody sitting there looking for a game to just get lost in. It is a long game. It's a great game. I mean, like I said, it, it got Game of the Year for many different categories back in 2014 and 15. So it's it's a game you could just get carried away with 70 hours and just, wow, this game, I just spent 70 hours on this game. So if you're looking for a game like that, Dragon Age is the game for you. It's probably less than 20, 15 bucks at GameStop right now, so it's still a great deal. It's not like it's aged or anything in the two or three years. It's still an amazing game. 
So I uh, highly recommend it. So moving on to Lego Jurassic World with Matt. Yes. So Lego Jurassic World came out June 12th, 2015. So it's definitely a little bit of an older game uh, developed by Traveler's Tales. I believe Traveler's Tales are the same developers that make most of the Lego games or they have at least their hand dipped in that pot with most of those Lego games. So basically, Lego Jurassic World is kind of, if you're familiar with the Lego type games, you know, Lego Star Wars, Lego Batman, those types of games, very similar in how it's structured. So basically, the game just sets you up in different levels, linear levels most of the time. Jurassic World, Lego Jurassic World gets a little bit open, but not not too much, nothing open like Connor was just talking about with Dragon Age or Witcher 3, but uh, it gives you a chance to walk around and explore but basically, you go from level to level, and what you're doing is trying to... They'll place puzzles in your way, enemies. You know, you're trying to get through the enemies and the puzzles, and basically just get to the end of that level and move on. And throughout the game, you know, you collect the Lego studs, and you can find the golden studs, the golden pieces. A lot of collectibles where you can find and unlock new characters, and you can interchange which characters you use for different levels because different characters have different abilities and skills they can use to help get through different obstacles or get into like secret areas that you couldn't get into on your first playthrough. So then you go back. The idea is they want you to go back and play through again with the new people you've unlocked so you can get into new areas. So basically, the things that I liked about LEGO Jurassic World is this is another game. And I'll, let me preface, too, that I did play this on the Wii U. So the game is out on almost every imaginable platform, uh, Xbox, PlayStation, PC, handhelds, 3DS, Vita, uh, it's everywhere. So you can pretty much pick that up no matter what system you have. But the big thing with me was that, uh, for a like, was that I was able to play this co-op with my fiance Nicole. So that was another uh, plus we were able to play together and the thing about Lego Jurassic World, and this will, this is kind of one of my dislikes as well for me as a more hardcore gamer, is that it's very easy. The game is very, very easy, so it does not punish you at all if you die. Uh, it really tries to help you out a lot if you're stuck on a puzzle. It'll tell you where to go, or maybe if you should try using this other character's ability. It's always trying to help you out. You can die as many times as you want, and you'll just keep reviving. There's no game over or anything like that. So it's very easy, but that kind of made it nice for me and her to play together because it didn't have to be too frustrating. Um, so that helped out a lot. The other thing I liked was just the Jurassic Park setting. I thought the setting was really cool. They did a good job of you kind of revisiting scenes from the movie and going back and kind of reenacting those scenes and... It just was kind of put you back in that film, and to be in a Lego world, it just felt kind of nice. And it it has that kind of charm to it. You know, it's got a cartoony feel. They try to make a lot of jokes. It's got a, a big sense of humor. So that, those are the things I liked about it. Dislikes, I already talked about it being too easy, but it's also it can kind of be kind of dull or repetitive because a lot of the levels are pretty similar. It's just kind of go through, fight your way, do the puzzles, and continue on to the next level. So. It can get a little bit repetitive, a little bit dull sometimes if you're in levels where you're just kind of moving forward and there's not much going on. Uh, the thing, the other dislike I had, it might be specific to the Wii U version, but the frame rate had some issues in some of the higher action scenes or if there was a lot going on on screen, the frame rate would kind of dip. And that's my, I have kind of a trained eye being a PC gamer and just a hardcore gamer in general. So... I noticed the frame rate dips and that stuff kind of bothers me a lot. I really don't have much tolerance for that, but that's just my own personal preference. It was nothing that broke the game or anything like that, but it was definitely an annoyance for me. Uh, the other dislike is the game's really short. Uh, it only took us about, I want to say maybe five to seven hours to beat. And that's just kind of those, that's how those games kind of go. But it would be nice to, you know, if you're going to go out and spend $60 for a game when it comes out, or even you know forty dollars or something. You you want to be able to get some some play out of it. Obviously, they're hoping that you go back and play with the other characters, so it has some replayability to it. But that that was kind of something that bothered me a little bit. Overall, I gave the game a seven point five, which is good. I liked the game. I thought it was fun. It was good 
kind of for me and my fiance to play together. That's kind of what it was for. I don't think I ever had any intentions of really playing it on my own or solo. And I think it worked out better that way because we were able to have more fun together, just kind of reacting to each other and how we did. So I think that was kind of where I was at with it. And I think that if you like Lego games in general, then this is definitely a game you want to pick up because it doesn't, it's nothing different. It doesn't really change the formula or anything like that. But if you like those games, then you're going to be pleased with it. So I gave it a 7.5 and I liked it. Now, man, I know, I know you mentioned the stud thing. Uh, how yeah. many of those are in the game? I, I want to say there's like 30. Would you say they're difficult to find? The studs, I think, can be if you're trying to really find those. That's when you have to use those other characters probably to get into those secret areas. Okay, well, good news to the listeners. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you've already found three studs. So <laughs> you can tell you that off wow. of your account. Sorry wow. about that line of questioning I had to do. Sorry. I have uh, two disclaimers <clears throat> about Jurassic World real fast. If you're looking to pick up Jurassic World, the first disclaimer is if you buy it on a handheld, you do not have the open world uh, access to you. Uh, let's only council exclusive the open world yeah, where you can right. explore the park. The other disclaimer is do not buy this on a Nintendo device because it's probably way more expensive than it is on any other. Yep. Like I would buy it on the Vita or PS4 before I bought it on Nintendo Wii U or even the 3DS. But uh, that's just me. Moving on to our discussion topic for today, achievements slash trophies. What is the point anymore? Does anybody really care at this point? Uh, here's two stories I want to share with you guys about my experiences with achievements slash trophies. The first experience is Modern Warfare, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Back when I played that game, I was really into achievements. I beat that game and got all the achievements. I completed it. I got the 1,000 out of 1,000 possible points, and I was really into it, and I wanted to do that for a lot of different games. Uh, I even did that for God of War 3. I didn't get all the trophies in God of War 3, but I did make it a point to get a lot of them, especially the Challenge of Mount Olympus uh, trophy. Matt, do you remember that trophy? Oh, yeah. That yeah, was that's, that's a tough fun. one. If you, if you own God of War 3 and you have not checked out Challenge of Olympus, please check it out. It's very difficult, and the trophy is very worth it in the end. But my other story is when I stopped caring about trophies or achievements and is when i picked up the scholarship edition of bully on xbox 360 i love bully it's one of my all-time favorite games so when i bought it and i got it for xbox 360 what i wanted to do is i wanted to play it as much as i could so what that meant was looking through the achievements finding achievements that i wanted to complete and trying to grab all those achievements just to play it more and more and more because i just i didn't want to stop playing i didn't want to just replay it i just wanted more of it So I'm looking through the achievements, and I'm reading them, like, you know, beat the game on hard, complete all your classes, and then I spot a few of them right in a row. Buy 100 soda cans from the vending machine. Bounce a ball 100 times. Throw 100 apples. Stuff like that, where I'm like, (laughs) no, that's not making the game any more fun. That's just tedious tasks that are going to add another 20, 30 minutes onto my gameplay. It's not making it any more fun. I'm done with achievements. Where, Where do you guys stand on that? Well, I think that when I okay. sorry, Dave, I think that when I first got introduced to achievements, like most people, I think I was very excited about it, and I thought, hey, this is a cool way now to kind of track my progress in the game because a lot of times they give you an achievement for beating chapters or you know moving on. But I thought it was cool to go after those things. It gave you an extra challenge, gave you something else to look out for, because I thought you know like you're example of call of duty counter something whereas it was complete this challenge or get this many headshots or something like that i thought that was kind of cool because that's something that just kind of enhanced the game for you but yeah when it got to the point of jump up and down a hundred times or something like that it just became really tedious and dumb and i didn't see really the reasoning why i should spend time doing that and a perfect example for me was in the gears of war series they had this achievement that I think it was, um, I forgot exactly what the achievement was called, but it was this insane achievement where you had to get almost, I think, 20,000 kills or something. And just, it had all these things tacked on to it that to me just made it seem like a chore instead of just enjoying the game. So I kind of agree with you, Connor, where I feel like achievements have kind of 
gone away from me. Now, if I get achievements in a game, it's just by pure chance. And I don't even look to see what it was really. I'm not, I really have no interest in it anymore. So Dave, where do you stand on this achievements? I think to demonstrate my feeling on achievements, we need to go on a journey back to November of 2009 when wow. one of my favorite games of all time, Left 4 Dead 2, which, by the way, got lots of love on our list for uh, couch co-op games. Yes, it did. Left 4 Dead 2, in my opinion, is your prime example of how to do achievements. Um, I remember some of the achievements that I was hunting almost more so than some of the actual in-level tasks you have to do to advance the individual uh, missions. Uh, for example, uh, m our favorite one, my buddies and I, was when you had to take Noam Chomsky. It was this little gnome <laughs> that you got from a circus <laughs> map, uh, and you had to take him to the end with you and get on the helicopter with him safely, and it was just hilarious tossing this little gnome around and trying to keep him available to pull on the helicopter and you're leaving all your friends behind left for dead. Uh, so you could get Noam Chomsky onto the plane and they had a ton of really kooky stuff like that in left for dead too. And the original left for dead as well. But I think that a single player game or multiplayer game, if you want to make a good game with good achievements, you need to have incentives for people to do it. Like Connor said, you don't want to be bouncing a ball a hundred times. Um, however, I remember all the way back to Goldeneye. To unlock some of those, I know these aren't achievements, but to unlock some of the cheats, do you guys remember doing that? Yep. You had to like beat facility in two minutes or yep. like get through this level without shooting a bullet. Like that kind of stuff is wh what the evolution of achievement should have been. It should not have been dumbed down to things like chapter one complete. Here's an achievement that you beat chapter one, chapter two complete. <laughs> Here's an achievement you beat chapter two, you know reload your gun 7,000 times. Like yeah, that's, those are, that's those a legitimate achievement. achievement. That's a legitimate achievement. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those, those are not achievements. Those are things you do when you have no other games to play. So, um, I don't know. Done wrong would be again, what I just mentioned done, right? Look, look at left for dead Two. look at Goldeneye. Yeah, like that. And I think for achievements for me, I do, when I get a new game, I do like to look through the trophies or achievements just to see like, is there a cheat trophy yeah. for, playing the game a certain way or something like that just to make it more fun also i want those achievements and trophies so i could give me a reason to go back and play through the game like uh like for example nintendo nintendo doesn't have an achievement or trophy system i kind of wish they did at times because i played bayonetta one and two last year on my wii u and i love the game so much but i'm not a person who's just going to go back and replay it like right away but if they had an achievement for beating it on hard or playing getting a certain combo score or beating all your scores after you already beat each because you get scores per level like that's the kind of stuff i wanted so i could get the incentive to go back and play it, rather than like oh now i'm going back to play it again this is still fun but uh there's got to be more to it so I, I just think that um you know that's where i stand on achievements i just wish that they did not steer into this direction of making them just pointless <laughs> do, do you want to see achievements continue or are you ready for them to be done I'm at this point. I'm ready for them to be done because there's they're not doing them right anymore. Like I said with the bully achievement, it's only gotten worse from there because now a lot of games, since multiplayer is such a main feature in gaming, that a lot of the achievements nowadays are play a thousand matches of my matchmaking or up get a level fifty of your character. You know stuff like that where it's like, well, now I got to do this. And like Matt was saying about Gears of War, Gears of War does that. And at this point, they should just stop if they're not going to make it legitimate achievements or trophies. Yeah, I think people nowadays, I think for people who really st are still into achievements, it's it's nothing more than status or bragging rights for them, I feel like, at this point. Because it's kind of, there's no other logical reason I can think of in today's games to really go hunting for achievements other than the fact to just say that you did it. Right, exactly. So, uh, moving on to news, there's got one news story for us today, a uh, pretty big one for me personally, I don't know if you guys will feel the same, but uh, Platinum, the developers Platinum, uh, the makers of Bayonetta 1 and 2 and Nier Automa, they are coming out with a new IP they announced last week, I'm excited, I don't know anything about the new IP, I don't know if they knew, know anything about the new IP, but I'm excited, because <laughs> they're, they, they've been pumping out some good ones, so I'm pretty jacked up, do you guys have any excitement over this, these, this news or no? Nope. <laughs> I'm excited because I you introduced me to Bayonetta Connor, so 
and I like that style of gameplay. I'm playing near Automata right now, so I'm I'm excited to see where they're headed and what's the next thing in store for them. Yeah, I, think, I just I, don't have experience with it. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 yeah, it's a little bit different of a style. But uh, yeah, let's bring this episode home with our top three Mario Kart games. I believe I started us off last week, so let's go with Matt this week. What's your number three? Okay. My number three is actually Mario Kart 7 on the Nintendo 3DS. And Ooh. it was one of the first games I got on the 3DS. And I was very impressed with how it played and how it felt on the handheld. I had some concerns, obviously, going into that, but it turned out to be one of my favorite. Wow, shocker right off the bat. Dave? Uh, my number three, and I know, Connor, this is your least favorite Mario Kart, or one of them, is Mario Kart 64. I know we had talked at length about this, but... Oh, wait, Dave, when the I, title I was of... favorite, not least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, it's my number three. And, and when I think back to the N64, I think of three games, and those three games are Super Mario 64, GoldenEye, and Mario Kart 64, because those three games are the games that I sank hundreds of hours into easily, sleepovers, whatever, and, and that's, that one just grew near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I Mario 64, or Mario Kart 64, I cannot go back and play. It's, just, it's not fun to me anymore, but my number three is the Super Nintendo Super Mario Kart. I just think that game is it's nostalgic, it's fun, it's, uh, it's just a good time. It's a way better time. Then uh, Mario Kart 64. These guys are disagreeing with me right now. I stand by my word. Super Mario yes. Kart is number three. <laughs> Moving on. Matt, what's your number two? My number two is actually Mario Kart 8. Um, I have the Wii U version. I just think the game is smooth. The controls are perfect. I love the levels in that, the courses in that game, and it provided me with a lot of entertainment. Dave? My number two is Matt's number three, Kart 7 for 3DS. Uh, I, I thought it was a solid game. And then what really won me over as well is I love DS download play, and it, yeah. not many games do it as well as Kart 7. Kart 7 is, you know, aside from Mario Party, it is the DS download game that everybody should have. Agree. My number two is Mario Kart 8, just like you, Matt. Uh, I love that game. It's very good. Uh, there's a couple things. I don't know if I like the 12 people in a race idea. I think it gets a little crowded in the middle at times. You're kind of in no man's land, but yeah, uh, we'll talk about that another time. But I think it's 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 a really good Mario Kart title. So uh, moving on to our number one. Matt, what is your number one? My number one is Mario Kart Double Dash from the GameCube. That game, I know Connor, me, you, and our good friend Tony... My memory with that game is I think we were on a Christmas break from school and we just spent hours and hours just beating all the cups and making sure we got first place, unlocking all the all the new characters, all the new courses, and we just put so much time into the game. So that it's a nostalgia, but also the game just plays super well, holds up really well today. Um, Dave, what's your number one? Well, while you guys were doing that, I was studying for my college finals. <laughs> uh, so Mario Kart 8 <laughs> Deluxe. For the Switch is my number one, and Switch, for the same Switch, reason these Switch, guys love Switch. Mario Kart 8, all those same reasons, now add in the fact that I get all the DLC, which I never had for my Kart 8, and um, the fact that you get two weapons, just like you do in Double Dash, that makes Kart 8 Deluxe my favorite one. Yeah, my number one is Double Dash, obviously. I love that game. Yeah. It's the best racing game I've ever played on any platform ever, hands down. I if I were to bust out my GameCube right now, I could play it for hours. I love everything about it. It's perfect. I love the dual two characters. You know, you could have Diddy Kong and Toad, offense and defense. Toad will give you mushrooms. Diddy Kong will give you bananas. So you get out in the lead. Then you got Diddy for defense, fight people off. It's great. My story with Double Dash is we, Tony and I competed in a uh, tournament at a library once. <laughs> and so I played two weeks straight up to this point, getting ready for this uh. tournament. Tony sacrificed himself to get me into the finals. And then the guy, the guy running the tournament gave us uh, the qualifying round as Baby Park. And if you know what Baby Park is, it's just a tiny circle where eighth place can win in half a second. And so I got last place to a bunch of seven-year-olds, and I was very disappointed. <laughs> and I was like 17 at the time. So I was not happy. That's my double dash story. I love that game. 
So that's the uh, episode four of the Land Partners Woo. podcast. If you want to email us, landpartners at gmail.com, send us a message. If you have a discussion topic, a list idea, just some feedback, anything, we just want to hear back from the listeners. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, see you next week.